um, uh, hello, everybody, and uh, uh, particularly to my distinguished um, panelists over here who I'll introduce in just a moment um, first, and then I'll give a little bit of my introduction. Uh, I'd like to welcome, of course, the audience um, that is watching right now, as well as the audience that will be watching the replays, which is uh, very often a very, very wide and and worldwide audience, you know, the course of the next few weeks in all time zones. Uh, my name is Gurvinder Aluwalia, and I'm privileged to uh, bring for Harassis, as well as from my expertise and everybody's expertise over here, <clears throat> This panel to discuss using simulations to train AI. Um, and if we look at uh, if you look at this from one perspective on where what AI is doing to the world and to us, um, mm -hmm. one very simple chronology that I often share, and that is um, machines, meaning digital machines that we are headed to talk about over here in a few minutes. Machines have brought down the cost of tabulation. That's kind of where some of modern computing started. Then they brought down the cost of computation, which is really the era that we mostly live in and also the era where my career started, if you may. And when I say brought down the cost of computation, I don't mean spreadsheets and those kind of things. I also mean the ability to call like from here to Hong Kong where Wolfgang is or anywhere in the world um, pretty much at zero cost is the cost of a phone call these days. So that's all an element of computation. And now where we are positioned with the use of digital machines is AI is bringing down the cost of prediction. Now, these, these capabilities and these models for AI and machine learning, they need to be trained in order to be useful. Um, and there are simulations that could be created to mimic extreme events to speed up AI training. Will we believe that um, doubling digital trading systems will yield fail-safe software uh, when absolute safety is demanded, like in aviation, where one of our experts comes from, um, like in uh, mobility and uh, vehicles, where a little bit of my expertise also comes from, like in supply chains, which are not so much about velocity, but they are about criticality in movements of goods and trades, which is where Wolfgang's expertise uh, comes from. Does this mean that autonomous transport will never be, you know, quote unquote, licensed as safe, or do we have to change the yardsticks around how licensing um, measurements and approaches and policies uh, should be should be followed? So, <clears throat> to discuss some of these matters. Uh, let me introduce our two distinguished um, panelists. And the third of our panelists, for those of you who might be wondering, had had a medical emergency quite literally like just five minutes before we went live, uh, got a notification that she will not be able to join. Um, and that is uh, just to recognize her participation is uh, Frida Polly, who comes from a neuroscience kind of a background. Uh, but in the meantime, um, let's make the best of the experts that we have over here. Francis Gowers has contributed to the design of over 30 unmanned land, sea, air, and space vehicles. He's currently the autonomy lead for Bell Helicopter USA, which is in Fort Worth, Texas. Incidentally, just up or down the highway from where I am, which is in Dallas, Texas. Um, and I'll give it to, to Francis in just a moment to give a little bit more of his very, very distinguished and very unique uh, background, um, which many of us don't get to, you know, tinker around and play with the kind of serious systems, Francis, that, 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 that you go with. So why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself and then we'll turn to Wolfgang's introduction. Um, sure. As I said, um, Francis Gowers, I work, I'm the Associate Technical Fellow for Autonomy at Bell, which means I'm the, the, the technical expert for autonomy for the company. Um, my job is to make helicopters fly by themselves. Uh, my, my background, I started off in the Air Force as a uh, satellite uh, manager uh, at the Air Force Satellite Test Center. Uh, when I got out of the service, I went to uh, NASA and uh, uh, 
honestly started at the bottom, but I worked my way up to be the lead engineer for command and control on the International Space Station. Um, and I uh, had all of the, that means I had all the onboard networks, all the onboard computers and all the uplinks and downlinks uh, for the station. And uh, I might mention it's still up there. It's still working. <laughs> and, you know, those of us, we had our doubts when we were putting it together, but it's all, it's, uh, it's hanging in there. Uh, do, it's actually doing very, very well. We're, I'm quite proud of our contributions and uh, of myself and my 6,000 colleagues that helped uh, design the International Space Station. Uh, from there, I, I got involved in uh, autonomous systems and simulation. I've spent roughly half the career doing sim engineering simulation, uh, using simulation as a tool to design things. And then I uh, worked on the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, for instance. Uh, worked on uh, with the Navy on the Aegis Cruiser, uh, Ballistic Missile Defense Organization. Um, and then the other half was doing unmanned vehicles. So I started, I did my first robot project in 1984 and then started from there, uh, DARPA Grand Challenge. Uh, like a lot of people got involved in autonomous self-driving cars, uh, became the deputy chief engineer for unmanned vehicles for the U.S. Army's Future Combat Systems Program, where we did seven uh, self-driving car systems. And then the, like, uh, Flowball did stuff like I was ahead of the, the yellow line for NFL football and uh, NASCAR and uh, IndyCar. I uh, did design the telemetry system for them. And I'm still involved these days with uh, Formula One racing. And then, like I said, I got from there to Thomas Vehicles, uh, CTO of um, uh, Gamma 2 Robotics, designing robot security guards. And then now, I'm, now we're flying helicopters. Thank you, Francis. And might I add a little bit of color given your Air Force background? Um, I want to thank you for your service. And uh, I particularly relate to it um, because I grew up, um, of course, I've been over 30 years in the United States, but I grew up uh, up until my undergrad education uh, at military camps in the largest democracy of the world and the fourth largest Air Force of the world, which is India. Mm -hmm. I'm an Air Force brat. Um, so uh, let me uh, let me um, turn our attention to uh, Wolfgang, who who brings a a totally different and diverse set of expertise, and that is for supply chain. But I want what I would like this uh, audience and the discussion to appreciate is is the is, is a common thread of how AI is affecting multiple use cases, multiple industries, multiple applications. And Wolfgang's expertise comes from global supply chain as a technology strategist, board member, advisor, and business angel uh, with extensive industry and leadership experience as a senior executive and partner in business and institutions worldwide. Um, I'm going to give it to Wolfgang uh, in just a moment to introduce uh, his background more directly himself. Wolfgang uh, Limacher is the operating partner at Anchor Group from Hong Kong. He's currently joining us from uh, Berlin, uh, from Germany. Wolfgang, over to you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, Govinda, for the for the introduction. Um, yeah, it's a it's a great topic, and and in, indeed, I'm coming from a very different perspective. I'm I'm an application an impact person. I have been running businesses, regional business, country business, regional business, global business, um, and uh, was uh, the CEO driving innovation and thinking about um, how we could uh, improve our, our operational processes. There's warehouse automation, there is uh, uh, visibility, big topics, uh, also in the space of AI. I also was the head of supply chain and transport industries at the World Economic Forum, uh, where we worked, in fact, on autonomous vehicles, but also from an impact perspective. So what looking in 2014, 15 into what is the benefit? Is it worthwhile? And, and what do people think uh, about autonomous vehicles? And uh, one interesting uh, outcome of a 5,000 people survey was that um, the consumer um, and the citizens, they combine 
um, the self-driving part with the sustainability part, which was very interesting. So for them, it's an electric vehicle. Uh, maybe that's the impact of Tesla, but uh, that, was the, um, that was the perception. And we worked at the time on uh, how could we realize a world uh, which is much more optimized, uh, where you have self-driving cars that have less accidents. There are about 1.2 million fatal um, uh, accidents in, in the year in the world. So that's definitely a number. And uh, people are worried about the safety of self-driving cars, but we are also not perfect, as we all know. Um, so we looked into, into this. Um, we looked into the sharing economy. So you bring the self-driving then into this, the sharing economy uh, space and say if there are vehicles driving around, you can choose to drive together with somebody uh, and bring your fare down, or you say, I don't want that, and then you have a different price. So these were the, the models we looked at. We worked with the city of Boston and uh, uh, made a study. We also uh, looked at the fringes in how to bring uh, the, the freight part into the whole equation, but the passenger part is already so complex that... Um, that, that we, we left it really at the fringes. Uh, it was much more on the drone side where, where cargo came into, into play. Yeah, and uh, after the forum, I, um, I became partner uh, at Anchor Group, which is a Swiss-based investment firm. So we are investing in industrial technology. So, and uh, I'm the domain expert for the supply chain part of it, for the business models. So that's what I'm doing doing now um and uh, i leave it i leave it here thank you wolfgang and you know mm -hmm. to your point about um we as human make mistakes and have accidents like in vehicles uh it to to err is is human but there seems to be an axiomatic expectation arising from that that while to err is human we have an expectation to get perfection out of out of machines um, so I'm going to, at this point, um, do two things. Uh, I'm going to slip in my introduction in just a moment. Uh, but as and I'll pay attention and process those as we go along. Um, if you already have any questions, just drop them in. If you have questions later, just, you know, drop them in as you go along. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. I'm getting a little instability error in my screen. Can you hear me okay, Francis? Yes, we lost you for just a moment, though. Okay, yeah, okay, I suspected that. All right, so um, my name is Gurvinder Alwalia, and I'm the, uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Digital Twin Labs and a few other um, ventures. I'm also an advisor at the Gates Foundation for their digitization, global digitization program, particularly related to supply chains, uh, which Wolfgang, you might appreciate a little bit given your background. Um, and um, uh, previous to my current venture uh, role at Digital Twin Labs, which I started in 2017, uh, previous to that, I have a you know deep and long and wide history in large technology companies, um, mainly in the US. I also stationed in Europe on certain expat assignments uh, for some parts of my career. Uh, most recently, prior to Digital Twin Labs, I was the chief technology officer for IBM's blockchain, IoT, and cloud business. I spent uh, uh, about 10, 11 years at IBM. Uh, my formal training is um, graduate studies in computer science from Mississippi. I did my grad research at um, University of California, Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley Labs, uh, where I am also and currently an advisor at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs uh, incubator. Um, and in fact, uh, my first experience during the winter of AI back then was in Lisp programming on Xerox uh, workstations. And I'm sure 
if not Wolfgang, I'm sure Francis uh, <laughs> knows what I'm what I'm referring yeah. to, and maybe some in the audience as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of my career uh, in recent times has been focused on on contemporary technologies. Um, of course, uh, not necessarily the expert in machine learning, but my deep and wide expertise has been in cloud, in IoT, uh, and in blockchain. I was uh, lucky enough in all humility with a few other colleagues at IBM uh, for us to implement the first proof um, of implementation, implemented proof of using blockchain in enterprise uh, settings and on enterprise networks for the first time ever on the planet. Uh, and that was circa 20, around circa 2014, which sparked the entry of blockchain into enterprises and business use cases. Um, all my work is currently spearheaded by blockchain and um, a few other examples of the work that we've done has been implementing supply chain for the global trade of diamonds based on blockchain. Um, I had my early fingerprints, um, Wolfgang, you would uh, appreciate this on TradeLens, which is the global container shipping, um, done additional work in the mod gate space for using mod technologies, and also building out a crypto, um, uh, I'm sorry, a cybersecurity uh, product, uh, risk management cybersecurity product for small, medium enterprises as well as large enterprises. Um, so let me uh, come out of that role and more into my moderator role as well as uh, I might double play as a panelist given that we have a very uh, intimate group here. Uh, so let me, um, uh, Francis, um, uh, you know, turn our attention to you uh, and then we'll go for some questions to Wolfgang. If we look at the title um, of the event, right, we are talking about using simulations to train AI. Maybe you can help the audience unpack what is the difference between simulations, which we've known for a very, very long time, and AI algorithmic AI models? Can you unpack that a little bit sure for thing. us, uh, Francis? Sure thing. So yeah, so AI models today are primarily created through a training process, which is to say that we throw them a lot of data, uh, and uh, that data has to be very carefully labeled. And so, for example, if I were training an AI to diagnose breast cancer, I would present to it, if I could get them a million x-rays of uh, tissue, and then uh, some number of them would have, would be positive, would have cancer, and some number of them would, have, would not have cancer, hopefully in proportion to that occurrence in the real world. And we would then train the AI to recognize or differentiate or predict, as you said, which one of the, the, sam the sample set is a positive and which ones are negative. So, I mean, and certainly, you know, we have the very big concern of having true positives, true negatives, false positives, uh, telling somebody they have cancer when they don't, or a false negative, not telling somebody they have cancer when they do, very, very serious. So, um, so the bit about doing that, I imagine, you know, uh, I'll use self-driving cars as an example. So that's a fairly well-contained process. When we go to, to do a self-driving car, the world of a self outside of a self-driving car is not as fixed as an X-ray, you know, of, of the same body, you know, 10 million X-rays of the exact same body part. Uh, the outside world is chaotic. It's all sorts of different regions. You can imagine, you know, driving in Saudi Arabia is not the same as driving in Alaska uh, or in Australia, um, uh, or you know, comparing Texas to to um, Germany. Um, um, all of those conditions, it would be very difficult for us to go all around the world. In fact. We're literally kind of faced with that prospect right now, going all around the world, collecting data from every possible weather, every possible climate, every possible terrain, every possible kind of road, every possible road sign, and collecting those all together in order to train the AI. And then we have to go in by hand, and for every one, for every single frame of maybe 10 million frames of video or, or pictures of the out of the roads we would need to label this part's the road, this part's the stripe, here's a stop sign, here's an overpass, here's another car, here's a truck, 
so on and so forth. Those all have to be labeled by hand. In fact, there an entire industry has sprung up of people who just go into data sets and do your labeling for you. And labeling, exactly. 10,000 people and you go, here you go, go start labeling all this data, you know. Um, so one of the solutions to this problem and the one that we've latched onto here at Bell it specifically is we what works a lot better is we can build a simulation of the outside world we can do stochastic sampling of all the different kinds of conditions we can build a simulator that can do snow and rain and ice and fog and hail or you know whatever all the conditions we have to to deal with and when we do it in a simulation we already know when we build the simulation even build it out of stochastic samples i know what everything in the image is all in advance because I built the image myself. So I have perfect labeling. So that combination is truly powerful to say we can have any condition, we can create any kind of road, even ones that don't exist, and all the weather, all lighting, all the seasons, all in a box and never have to get out of sight of the building. So that's what we're talking about. Tremendous, tremendous. Thank you, Francis. Let me uh, just switch a little bit of gears, set kind of re you know reorder the chairs over here before we turn um, turn turn before I turn a question over to Wolfgang and that is on the supply chain topic. So I'm going to share a few remarks and experiences from my side as well, uh, just in the in the dual role play over here, and then uh, that'll also set it up as a question, um, uh, Wolfgang, in in a, in a few moments uh, for you. So, um, if you look at the world of is a boring world until it breaks. Yes. And, you know, it's kind of like the network, right? Uh, until somebody, until it breaks, nobody knows it exists, which actually is the way we as technologists want technology to be. It doesn't have to be in our, in our face. It just has to work in the background. But as we all know, not just technology, but world over, um, how supply chains were broken in the midst of uh, the pandemic for the last two years and only now exacerbated with supply chains for commodity products like 30 percent of wheat i was listening to cnbc today uh wheat 30 percent of the wheat of the world comes from ukraine and how supply mm -hmm. chains particularly related to commodity uh agriculture uh those supply chains you know the wheels are beginning to uh come off now so uh, the last innovation, uh, having done work in the use of blockchain and AI and IoT and cloud, which are my main pillars of expertise, having worked and applied those pillars into the supply chain and container movement of the world, uh, the last major innovation in supply chain movements uh, really happened in 1973, if I'm not mistaken about the year, and that is when the container was invented. Um, <laughs> Wolfgang, you can correct me if I'm wrong in just a moment. Uh, but my point over there is is the following, that um, it, 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 it's, it takes, and these are two examples, like um, one of the learnings uh, that, that I got in, in, from some of this work is also um, most people don't realize that a, a humble uh, semiconductor component that goes into an OEM final assembly travels something like 16,000 to 25,000 miles around the world before it goes into a final product that a consumer buys. Um, your, your favorite tiramisu travels 40,000, the ingredients that go into it travel 40,000 miles around the world before it's served to you on a plate at a you know restaurant in Germany or Hong Kong or, or US. So the complexity in a flat global connected world around global trade and movement is, is quite frankly uh, mind boggling. It just happens quietly and when it breaks, it's really bad news. So turning that background into a question, Wolfgang, for you, where does AI come into play in the world of supply chain and logistics and how does it make it better? Yeah, first I would like to say that uh, there were a few other innovations in the supply chain, logistics, <laughs> up and spoke system, 
Uh, I, think, I, you know, I, I just... I just simplified so I could leave the expertise for you, but you're absolutely right. I did not mean to interrupt. Thank you. Yeah. No, and, and it is a a slow adopter, so uh, there is no doubt about this. And this is because these are operator; they don't want to change their process. There's there's a lot of inertia and resistance to change operational processes once they work. Um, so. Uh, where comes where comes uh, AI into play? Um, I take one which is in fact close to the simulation and the training topic. Um, people people may not know, and that's a typical operational problem, which is very boring but very unknown. Is that a lot of invoices are not getting paid? because they cannot be identified and allocated to a task. So, so there, either, there are AI solutions, or to a job or whatever, uh, there are AI solutions that, that take all the information which is in that invoice and then run through the entire, entire uh, company database and see whether there is one clue or hint where this invoice uh, belongs to. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, the second where it comes into play is also invoices. So it's the automation. This is more robotic process automation, a bit machine learning, uh, where you take, in fact, the human intervention out of the payment process. So it's, it's similar. This time we don't have an irregularity, we have an invoice that comes in, the machine reads the invoice, the machine checks whether this invoice is legitimate, and the machine pays based on the terms which have been set. So that's another piece. Then there is uh, the entire space of visibility. Um, if there is one hot topic in the supply chain, then it's visibility. Um, because... Uh, you cannot, you cannot manage a supply chain if you don't uh, see where your goods are. But as simple as that sounds, still a lot of supply chains, they are very manual. So people call and say, did my container arrive? Has my container been uh, processed? And, and that's also where then the, the push comes to really change this. For example, if you have suddenly in a port 10 people only answering calls, uh, then you wish to, to uh, automate the process. And whenever you are, you are automating, I think you are in that space where AI could play a role. If you talk the big topic of visibility, uh, a lot of people say, I would like to have this all on my screen. But imagine uh, the big companies, right? A GE, right? Or a GM. Uh, or Siemens, or Mitsubishi, uh, they have thousands of suppliers. Thousands of suppliers, they produce thousands of cars every day uh, with thousands of pieces. Um, so you cannot track this. So you want to have AI algorithms that can understand, and I, talk, I take Francis' example, that see cancer in the supply chain, right? They, they see that there is something not right. And then they are sending this uh, to one person, but there is more and more, this is your world, the distributed world, right, where you push it to a, an entire group and say, we have detected this. Can you check whether this is really a problem? And if yes, what can we do about it? Um, and, of course, this is still... Uh, very much descriptive analytics. Uh, you can also have machines, the, they say, okay, um, there is a problem. This is clearly Francis can speak about that, predictive maintenance and all this. And it can also be uh, prescriptive analytics that the machine says there is probably a problem and here's the solution. Um, and of course, that's all on the path of uh, of automation. And maybe the last example um, is we have just uh, written a paper 
um, and published it, which is in fact simulating different modes of operation at a port. So you know there is a big, big challenge with congestion in Long Beach on the West Coast, uh, LA, Long Beach, uh, Oakland. And there is there was that idea we operate 24-7. And then this has been done and there was some, some improvement. But did this improvement come really from the 24-7 or from all the other measures which have also been launched? So we, we thought uh, that uh, we should look into this. Um, we took real-life data from the port of Valencia and uh, compared the peaks uh, in the past with a 24-7 operation. And what came out was that the 24-7 operation it flattens out the peaks. It's not training the algorithm, but it's a simulation of, of different operating scenarios. Yeah. Um, very, very interesting uh, insights and comments. Uh, uh, Wolfgang, thank you for that. So uh, I'm, you know, ping-ponging over here and uh, I'm going to turn uh, my next set of remarks into a question for uh, uh, for uh, for Francis. Uh, we have about 15, 10, 15 minutes left. And I want to fit in at least these two topics and I'll just tell you and the audience what those are going to be. One is going to be around cybersecurity at the intersection of AI. And I'm particularly giving priority and asking that first in just a moment in light of the threat of cybersecurity that goes hand in hand with um, military security, uh, given, given the state of the world right now. Um, and the other topic I want to hit, if we have time, is a little bit around, uh, and that'll turn the question back to you, Wolfgang, and that's going to be around trade finance when you were talking about invoices and basically the layer of software that surrounds physical goods movements and supply chain, right? So I just kind of teed it up and hopefully we can ration our time, uh, the, the remaining 12 minutes or so to cover both of those topics. So I'll just have you, you know, be, be, be compact in, in the responses. So let me set up the first one, right? So, um, uh, Francis, there is this notion, and this is a little bit of some of the work that I'm doing where where um, uh, me and uh, another partner of mine, we are building a cybersecurity risk management product uh, for basically, you know, interactive kind of risk management um, uh, and to come up with a, um, a, a, not another tool, but a more cohesive way of handling, handling cybersecurity upstream in the stage of software where it is developed. And there is this notion which I want to spark the discussion around called software bill of material. In fact, it has a, I, I, I specifically picked that because the, the, the paradigm has parallels to bill of materials in manufacturing. It also has parallels to a supply chain, you know, uh, in like in like in physical supply chain. So similarly, we, we think of software development and putting software out and there's a whole supply chain associated with that the world learned that in a very hard way last year or year before last with the solar winds attack um, and then more recently with the log 4j um, uh, breach right um, so so the question i have is um, if we look at how innovation using ai and then into supply into sorry into cybersecurity purposes happens. It, it, most of the innovation over the last twenty years, thirty years, has happened on what we've called good enough architectures. And Anna Francis definitely will understand that phrase, where the in, where the internet innovated, the cellular industry innovated. That okay, if a call drops, you know, so what? We'll at least get more advanced, more progress and maturity in the technology out. And over time, we'll increase it. OK, so I'm not entirely sure whether the kind of systems we are building, certainly not the category where Francis is playing, which is in aviation, but even the ones that are coming into consumer like autonomous vehicles are going to necessarily lend themselves to good enough architecture approaches because they have to be perfect to the point, Wolfgang, you were making earlier. Um, uh, or do they have to be at, you know, a rocket science level of perfection in system engineering? It slows down innovation adoption, right? 
not a good or bad statement, but a statement of fact. So if we take those two extremes of innovation, Francis, where do you see the use of AI in cybersecurity or in autonomous uh, mobility? Where in that spectrum is there going to be something that is a hybrid between those two extremes of innovation? Where do you see it lying? Yeah, those are really good questions. Um, yeah, we've struggled with this already because we don't have, you know, just one aircraft. We have fleets of aircraft. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as Wolfgang probably is concerned with fleets of fleets of ships and trains and trucks, uh, we have thousands of, of customers out in the field. One of the things we're trying to keep up with right now is we're trying to go to something we call condition-based maintenance, which is to say we don't want to repair something just because it's a, right now we 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 go by hours. We say, oh, this part is had three, has 300 hours of runtime on it. It needs to be replaced. And we replace it whether it needs to, whether it's broken or not or worn or not. It just gets replaced because that's our best guess is to what we'd rather do is look at the symptoms of the, the helicopter, the vibration or the, the noise or whatever that this part goes through and use that to diagnose when it's wearing out and only replace it then. And then we'd spend a lot less money on maintenance. The problem with that is we need to collect an enormous amount of data and we need to get it back to the factory to where we can analyze it and basically build this giant database of symptoms that we can then use to diagnose problems. So, so you're saying, well, how does this relate to what I was asking? So that kind of creates a demand to be constantly updating the software on board the helicopter. And, um, and you know, our customers are kind of asking us, yeah, we'd like to see the same sort of technological advances on our helicopter that we have on our cell phones. So we want to be able to push software out there, but it has to be trusted software. It has to have a provenance. It has to have some means of proving that it's safe and it's the, what we, the, what they received is exactly what we sent, you know. So we're struggling with that right now, actually quite a bit. We're playing around with Docker containers and um, other um, types of systems that let us do what we call OTA, over-the-air updates. Uh, but packaging that up into some sort of a secure process that we can guarantee end-to-end -end delivery uh, is, is a real problem. And... Yeah. Uh, we are looking into, you know, doing private networks and building our own cell phone network, seriously, <laughs> and things of that nature just so that we're completely separate from uh, outside influences, let's say, that we can guarantee yeah. that the bits that arrive are the bits that got sent. So that to me, so, so you know, putting AI in that is, you know, it's trying to figure out, you know, is there some way we could teach an AI system to to look at the symptoms of I'm being, this is a suspect package or I'm being attacked or I'm being hacked or I've been interrupted or the, I got a man in the middle attack where the person that's talking to me is not the person I think they are. Uh, so, um, you know, we would want to be able to put those into, into a training model and train, a, train the system to recognize when it's under attack and, and to respond accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. I'll be brief with my transition remarks uh, because I want to get um, uh, Wolfgang your uh, inputs to my next question. But just for the setup for the audience, um, around supply chain networks, around the physical movement of supply chain networks, and this is a large part of what Digital Twin Labs from my venture does, the attention is to the software envelope, the digital envelope that surrounds it. So I want us to bring, uh, you know, throw a spotlight on that envelope, Wolfgang. And in that envelope are things like trade finance, invoice financing, where the bloodline of finance that goes into moving supply chain, keeping them humming, goes in. And until there is data sharing accuracy and accuracy of data, like in invoices, shipping, loading manifests and export import kind of authority controls. Uh, can you throw some light on the role of AI in data sharing, then particularly towards trade finance and compliance envelope that surrounds the movement of physical supply chains? Over to you, Wolfgang. And uh, why don't we take maybe three minutes and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, I would like, 
I would like to answer the question of the session and what I believe as well, and that very briefly. I believe that uh, autonomous vehicles will be licensed. Uh, I, I'm not worried that much about AI. Uh, the problem is in the hardware. Uh, bad weather, uh, the sensors don't work, the cameras don't work anymore. So, so they, there is still, for me, uh, about 10 years of, of work, but it will come and very gradually. Uh, that's what I what I believe on that point. Um, on the cybersecurity, um, also a, a few remarks. Uh, clearly, AI agents can protect uh, can protect the system. This is again the cancer. This is the antibody that detects uh, anomalies in a in a system. So there is that part. But what I also always stress is it's not only technology. A lot of breaches come through people. So they have access to the system. So there has to be a gatekeeping solution, uh, whatever shape or form that also covers that. Um, on the financing bit, um, there, there are multiple ways of looking at it. If you look at e-fulfillment, you have a, a digital warehouse. So with a, more or less a digital twin, uh, you know what is in, you know the value, and you can finance it, right? And it cannot move as long as it sits in the warehouse. So it's collateral. So that's an ideal situation. And there are products, inventory uh, financing, supply chain financing. So that's already reality. Then there is another, another piece to this. And this is linked to blockchain. This is the uh, tedious letter of credit, uh, mm -hmm. which takes weeks. And uh, there were a number of tests uh, are blockchain based and IoT based to automate the process and bring this down to hours. So we bring three to six weeks down to three to six hours, even faster. So, and this because uh, it is digital, there are a lot of checks which you can run, which you can not run on, on paper documents, which is very hard. So, so there is, uh, there is a, a trillion dollar opportunity because the especially the SMEs suffer from lack of finance because they cannot uh, demonstrate the track record and the transparency. The big companies don't have a problem with this. It's the small SMEs, uh, in particular in Southeast Asia. Got it, got it. Let me just begin to wrap it down. Um, of course, it's been so wonderful. A few closing remarks uh, from uh, from my end. Uh, you know, first of all, I will say, and uh, I'll get uh, Frida Polly to hopefully listen to the replay. Uh, uh, but I will say that I particularly missed her over here, uh, and especially the point, like Wolfgang, that you were making uh, around uh, the licensing aspect. Uh, the nature of autonomous system, Francis, that you are working on. I would have loved to hear her comments on what I refer to sometimes as, you know, self-sustaining systems and autonomous systems don't have to be just autonomous, but they have to be self-correcting, self-sustaining. And they have to be autonomous, not just autonomous from an engineering perspective, but uh, a lot of the work that we do, uh, we also look at systems being autonomous from an autonomous economy standpoint, right? Self-sustaining engineering wise, as well as self-sustaining in its economics. Simplest example is like a car paying, you know, earning and paying for itself. Uh, there's a much deeper discussion, but the reason I, I invoked, um, you know, I, I, I cited that I'm missing Frida Polly, who's, uh, I might recognize her work uh, award-winning from Harvard and MIT, neuroscientist, uh, is, is, is the perspective that neuroscience brings on how how we borrow, how we borrow, how engineering systems, digital systems mm -hmm. bo borrow from neuroscience, biological systems. Um, so uh, again, I, 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 I'll, I'll say in closing that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Francis was alluding a little bit to this and then um, um, Wolfgang, I think you said that the problem with autonomous uh, is, uh, is at the hardware layer. I come from a largely software background, but also hardware. And really, I come from a solution and venture background and product background. And what I believe in is that uh, uh, is that uh, hardware eventually fails and software eventually works. 
so it's a long journey. <laughs> it's a long journey, uh, and we continue all of us together in being on that journey and improving the products that we bring out to the world. So thank you so much once again uh, to the Horasis uh, organization for bringing this mm -hmm. together. Francis, particularly to you. Thank you. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, Wolfgang, particularly to you to put your gracious time and share your wonderful expertise with everybody over here. Yes, thank you all very much. I took a lot of notes. This was a lot of good material, <laughs> especially learned about. My wife works in supply chain, so I, 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 I have <laughs> I hear about this every night at the dinner table. So thank you so yeah. much. All right, yeah, and please. that brings us. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, for thank me you. as well. And um, just one comment: what we are talking yes. about is the connected, the connected world. The connected world is coming. And the yeah. connected work world will not work without AI. No. Correct. Absolutely. Well, mm -hmm. thank you both again, gentlemen, mm -hmm. and my thank you to the audience. Bye bye. Yeah, what a what a delight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you both. Really, See you really, really enjoyed the discussion. <laughs>